are uh, this is a weird video because it's the only one I am doing non full well that one day I am gonna have to re review this issue as part of my look at Nimrod history every one hundred videos. And this one will probably be like my twenty seven thousandth video. This is New Muties number 14. It is part of Common Second. And I have spoken before about how the whole Mutie Extinction story arc that ran for about four or five years, how I was fully invested in that. I honestly read or have read just about every single Excellent Men book from those days. And Common Second is the big climax to all these years of stories and coming second is just fucking epic i think you are best off just abandoning the excellent men books after this crossover everything immediate is resolved and other than stuff that the day with this character legend there is nothing worth reading after this story so that gets us neatly on to the other thing. This is the issue that sold me on Legend. It made me realise he was actually this character bursting with potential. And he hadn't really been used all that well in the past. He was always cast into the role of a reality warp and bad guy. And as my reviews of his first appearances attest... His relationship with his father was almost never explored. This is the variant cover for the issue. Every part of this crossover had great variant covers by David Fincher. And a lot of them are very, very expensive to get nowadays. But this one I had to get. This was one of my favourite moments of coming second. And this cover is fantastic. Legend, he gets brought into the plot as a big game changer. And I didn't know how this has not been on one of my cover spotlight videos yet. The main cover for this issue is actually pretty weak too. The other thing is on top of Legend, this issue also has Nimrod. This story has three different versions of Nimrod. There is the original Nimrod, who the Reverend Striker, he was using his arm as a weapon. The main central villain was Bastard. And then we had the big war, the big exciting, really taxing war on the excellent men. They have been besieged by an army of Nimrods. It would take ages to try and summarise all the needed backstory and events that led to this. But the main thing you need now is, this is it. This is the thing the excellent men have dreaded for years. A coordinated strike on them which could potentially end the mutie race once and for all. They are losing, people have died. And now cyclist... He has turned to Dr. X to try and get his son, Daniel Stevens, off the telly, involved in the war and hopefully change the tide. One ongoing subplot has been the slow treatment and attempt to help cure and fix Legend Psychosis. It was a pretty crap idea and it wasn't done very well, but Legend... Now he has hundreds and hundreds of alternate personalities with different powers as opposed to the three or four that he had before. But this factors into the plot because due to the nature of these personalities and their radical different power sets, it might be the ultimate weapon to fire against the Nimrods because by the time they develop a defence against one power, Legend, he can just have changed to another personality. And at this point, the battle is ganning poorly and the excellent men are outmanoeuvred and likely ganning to lose. 
Cyclist, he extends excellent men membership to any and all muties who have sought sanctuary with them. I did make a note to read this speech out, but I am deciding against it right now because I think this video might run long. But this plotline with drafting everyone, they didn't do all that much with this. I suppose we didn't really need to see it all. We get one more scene later in this issue. But that, as well as legend actually, they didn't really factor into the very final parts. Uh, this is near the end of the story anyway. This is chapter 11 of 14, I think. Then we have the Mutie Messiah, who will become the mascot for the death of this franchise. She was an alright character up to this point. She will become a Mary Sue fast. She is fine as a Mary Sue in this story, as it was built at that point. But after this, my god, does she become terrible. Uh, here, she is wanting to gun out and join in the fight, but they need to protect her. And Rouge, she is in charge of ensuring her safety, and she does an atrocious job at this. She just guns, yeah, okay, you can gun out and fight. Uh, Rouge, she actually gets castigated for this afterwards. Cyclist is like, you had one fucking job and you didn't bother with it. Uh, we have a bunch of excellent men here fighting against the Nimrod. The problem is the Nimrods all have countermeasures for all of them. And even when they defeat one, well, there's still a whole army of more to come. And Avocado here, he had a good character arc during this period. He had retired and just wanted to have a normal life being a bartender. What I'm saying is, I was completely invested in just about everything in the line. And then this big crossover came out that was built on all that stuff. And it was honestly amazing. I loved every minute of it and it felt like... It felt like the big final episode of a fantastic TV show. Maybe everything afterwards being shit is due in part to this story having so profusely been the absolute peak. But I truly do believe that, with the exception of some of Michael Lucifer's stories on adjectiveless excellent men, Every Excellent Men book was shit and hopeless after this. They missed the whole point of this story. They thought it was just another crossover when it was clearly meant as a cap and finish to a landmark stretch of the books. When this was over, they were meant to settle down. They were meant to go in a different direction. The excellent men had won their greatest victory against the worst possible odds. But all the creative teams wanted to keep things so that the excellent men were not winners. They immediately retcon and minimise the symbolic ending of this crossover so that there is as little victory as possible. They start amping up the child soldiers rubbish. In this, that is a testament to how dire the circumstances are. There's no sinister or irresponsible intent when Cyclist has drafted in children to help fight an army of robots off. People are dropping like flies or suffering enormous crippling defeats. Like here, the Nimrods, they break steel man's arms. Things are that bad that the younger muties like Hellion Keller and Serg, they are having to get involved regardless. This was meant to be an extreme example of the excellent men at war for the sake of their species. This wasn't meant to be the normal. Cyclist making these unpopular command decisions, his morals and his ethics being strained and stretched thin, 
him weaponizing children and sanctioning killing, uh, him conscripting and enabling some of their villains in a fight, it wasn't meant to be a reflection of the character. It was showing the character having to deal with, like, the worst scenarios possible. But then the books decided Cyclist was a bastard, and all this, it was just Cyclist being normal. And instead, Wolfman, he was amazing, and just... Everything got horrid and shit with the excellent men. Mr. Magnets, he was a hero, seaman, he is an important part of the team... It's all about the whore and her memory and a stupid Phoenix Force again. And even Cyclist and Emma Frosty split up. I fucking ate where the books went after this. We had we had the cynical excellent force which people love but it's just fucking unpleasant to me. Like every bit I have read of it, it's like an edgelord's wet dream. Dead pills... He's cutting off his own skin and forcing an unconscious wingman to eat it so that wingman can heal. And then there's a body who's just a flayed, skinless man. We just have a broken franchise after this. And not through the fault of this story. Through the fault of bad writers and editors who didn't know what to do or who colossally misunderstood the characters and... Just about every story done with them, including this one. I really do hate everything after this so much. End it here. Stop reading after coming second. If losing the two or three good stories with legend is what you stand to miss out on, so be it. Now though, we have the scene, the big scene that I loved. Legend, he is getting involved. All the Nimrods, immediately they redirect their attacks towards him, since he is an Omega level mutie. And now it is just Legend ganning around and selecting different personalities that are best suited to deal with the Nimrod units. And then swapping between them before they counter with any defensive measures. This is the sort of payoff to subplots from the various books that was so satisfying in this story. They knew they had legend sitting around and they realised there was a good way to bring him into the story and include him in the final push of the crossover that makes sense and is... This is just cool. This is really fun. Legend fighting a bunch of Nimrods. This is what I read comics for. Stuff like this. I didn't even like the character when I read this. Uh, Legend, he has helped turn the tables a bit so the excellent men can push forward. I have been describing it as a war and that isn't overselling it. This is like they are fighting an impossible war. There is also a subplot thing with excellent force. They have gone on a mission that I'm not getting into, but they have gone to destroy the Nimrod army at their source. And now it is time to pay off that earlier scene. We have Frog Boy and some other villains slash less heroic muties. Frog Boy is a coward who just wants to escape from the line of fire, but the others, which include the T-1000 and Scout Man, they actually accept and agree with Cyclist that there's no lines to be drawn now. They are all on the same side and need to help out. Uh, also, Scout Man, another character who had a little journey in these books, very much in the background of everything. But he also found some sort of inner peace and he wanted to shed his past. Frog Boy, he loses his finger and then they are attacked by a Nimrod who crushes one of their skulls. And then in the infirmary we have the Smurf trying to treat the wounded. Hellion Keller has lost his hands which is an example of the legitimate stakes that this story raised. 
but this will be a development for them to just make this character into a whiny villain. And then Mr. Magnets, he is going to re-enter the fight. And I didn't like Mr. Magnets as a hero or a member of the excellent men. But in this story, I have no problem whatsoever with him being alongside the excellent men. And right here, there is a glimpse at the David Fincher cover for next issue. Mr. Magnets fighting a bunch of Nimrods. One of the easier ones to get. And I probably should get it since it has Nimrod on the cover. Uh, the two covers with Nimrod on are two of the cheapest ones to find. I love this though. This is... I just remember reading this for the first time. I was on the Metro, I think. Gone into Callerton. I was hooked. I remember it well. Just how invested I was in everything. And how excited I was by everything happening on the page. And then how when Legend showed up... I felt like it was a big deal, and it was a big deal, and this is what comics can do best. The feelings I have and add for this issue, every comic is capable of that. Comics can mean just as much as music or films to a person. They can evoke the same visceral memories of where you were at a time in your life, or you can remember the thrill you got from reading them the first time. I might be biased here, but it would be criminal neglect to not award this issue seven thumbs up.